Um, so Steve's going to talk about um, anguish, forgiveness, redemption in a real life setting. So um, welcome, Steve. Great to be in Sydney. Uh, I'm from Perth, so uh, we didn't. We voted in a majority Labor government, but they didn't have. Ooh. But we lost the. They, <laughs> Yeah. No, they lost the referendum on whether we should secede. So, <laughs> so here I am, <laughs> passportless. It's an interesting time in our culture at the moment. Uh, everyone's got a the cancel culture term, has, which was not part of your uh, lexicon just a few years ago, seems to be the term that everyone's talking about. Everyone gets cancelled for something, and there's a fear of getting cancelled for something that you didn't know you were going to be cancelled for. And it feels like we live in a, a setting where forgiveness and grace and those sorts of things are evidently absent. And at Scripture Union in Perth, uh, an organisation that works with uh, school kids, uh, one of the staff members was asking me uh, for some help about writing some... didn't pick that one. These young students are fearful that even in their own cohort, they will do something or say something and with a social media presence that goes back into the past and brings it forward to the future or your present, they'll be canceled and they'll never be anywhere for forgiveness. And Douglas Murray, uh, an English author and a thinker, uh, wrote a book called The Madness of Crowds. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's worth a read. And he's not a man of faith. But he looked at around the world in the Western setting and he said, there's nothing but fiery denunciation for every minor thing that you may have done left in our culture. He thinks that the Christian framework, which he doesn't believe himself, kept a safety net about forgiveness and grace. And he thinks that going into the future, we're going into an unforgiving and very graceless setting in our culture where you can be judged by your worst joke 10 years ago. That's the culture that young people are growing up in. And we observe it as older men. Some of us are older, some of us look a little younger than we are, some of us look a little older than we are. And how are our younger generations coming through? What will life look like without that safety net of grace and forgiveness in our own context? I think that's a big question that's coming down the line culturally because Culture sits above politics and law. Politics and law are downstream of culture. Everything that's shifting is shifting from that direction. Now, those are abstract questions in some respect, and they're good to write about and blog about and uh, rail against. But I want to tell you a story that, for me, when I meet people and talk about situations where I meet people who are lacking in grace or struggling with forgiveness, I share occasionally just to say, the depths that you can go to and still see forgiveness in people can be quite amazing. And for me, that's a gospel story. The gospel word literally means good news. So I'm using it in a technical sense. So I want to tell you a story about my upbringing and background that brings me here today from the past. My, my grandparents were not married and my grandmother got pregnant. That sounds bad enough in a conservative setting, but put that into Belfast, Northern Ireland, with a brethren background of a very tight church experience. And my grandmother was shocked, horrified, worried, didn't know what to do. So the best thing that you do is you hide that and you get married very quickly and you move to where there is a border, Dublin, and you pretend it all has gone okay with her own parents not knowing anything about it. In fact, why would her own father want to know given he was the circuit preacher of the Brethren Church in Belfast at the time in West Belfast. West Belfast isn't quite what it is today or was in the last 30 years. So Jim and Rachel, my grandparents, moved to Dublin. My mother is born 
and immediately they give her away to a war widow from the 1914-18 war who was married at 16 in Dublin, pregnant at 1917, she was born in the turn of the century, pregnant in 1917, husband killed in the front, 1918. The way she made money to survive was to take in foster children and she had 45 foster children until as she's getting into her mid to late 40s, that slows down and she has six foster children and one of her own and her own child. My mum is one of those six. Mum is given away. By this stage, Rachel and Jim have split up. Jim ran off with another woman, leaving my grandmother bereft in Dublin and she promptly returns prodigal daughter-like to live in Belfast with her very strict parents, brethren, parents. No one knew my mum existed at this stage. For the first four years of, my, of her life in Belfast, no one was any the wiser. And my mum grew up in this family in uh, Upper Ormond Quay in Dublin. And in that setting, it was poverty. It was running around the fish market, stealing the ice off the fish, finding bubble gum on the, uh, the ground and che chewing that, swimming in the River Liffey, a friend drowning at one stage in that sort of almost Guinness Black River. I think that's where they get the Guinness from. They just dip it into the River Liffey. It's got the same kind of head on it. <laughs> same consistency. Mum loved it. Poverty, seven family members and lots of love. And every Christmas, she would look through the keyhole into the sitting room where the Christmas tree was, and they weren't allowed in until Christmas Day, and they'd rush in, and Mum would get an orange, a clay pipe for blowing bubbles, and a doll from the Salvation Army that had been stitched up or that had been given by the wealthier kids of Dublin. But about the age of six, she started to get visitors who would come down to visit the family, but take a special interest in mum, come in a big black shiny car with a slightly different accent. I think you know where this is going. Someone in Dublin had tipped off someone in Belfast about the presence of mum. So mum comes into this, uh, the parlour and introduces everyone and they talk. Six months later, it happens again, six months later. At, at this stage, mum has a foster sister who she thinks is her own sister. Sylvia, and they would sit out on the front step and eat you know, chocolate or ice cream when they could afford it, and they were inseparable. One day, the big black car pulls up to the step and Sylvia and Mum are sitting on it, and they said to a man and a woman leaned out and said, come into Cafella's in Dublin, famous ice cream parlour, for ice cream. The girls get in the car. They go to Cafella's. They sit in one of those long-backed red chairs that you get in the ice cream parlours of the of the early 50s and with distracting Sylvia, this couple put mum in the car and they drive across that border for two hours back into Belfast, back into West Belfast, back into the house where Rachel had left those years ago. And my mum's first memory is waking up the next day in a strange bed and saying, bolt right up in bed. Mummy will be worried about me. And a strange woman walks into her bedroom and says, I'm your mummy. I'm your mummy, which was the start of a, a breakdown for my mother, as you can imagine. The Christian message that was in that house had all the bells and whistles, but it didn't know how to deal with forgiveness and grace and dealing with failure. It was a mini cancel culture in some respects. And I wish that were the worst part of the story I would like to tell you <laughs> about my mother. But let me skip forward a few years because that based the whole of my mum's life. Am I acceptable? Have I been forgiven? What can I do? Where do I fit? Perhaps even nine years later, when you think about that, the age of eight to the age of 17, she meets my dad who's an East Belfast boy. The Pet Shop Boys wrote that song for my parents, West End Girl, East End Boy. <laughs> East Belfast, my dad grew up in Shipyard, Harland and Wolf, all those. Uh, the Titanic was built there, which says a lot about Northern Ireland in general in the, in the next 40 or 50 years. 
single small house, rows of them, one cold water tap, no bathroom, toilet out the back. They just weren't quite good enough for West End Belfast. Anyway, my parents, my dad was the love of my mum's life, looking for someone who would protect her and love her and look after her. And he did. Eventually, we came along. I have a twin brother who works at Macquarie University. Uh, he's an atheist, and I'm a pastor of a church. It's fantastic at Christmas. It really is. Um, and we moved to Australia. Uh, and eventually, we had a couple of other siblings, got younger brothers, and we went back to Northern Ireland, and then we came back to Australia, at which point my dad, factory worker that he was, my parents had no background of education, both left school at 14, meets someone younger at work, 17 years younger, and leaves my mum one day before my brother and I started university. The great breakout generation I am, if you know what I mean. Perhaps you are that, that your parents grew up working class, and suddenly you're the person who goes to university. It changes your life. But that, that event changed our lives as well. My mum suddenly found that in the church setting she was in Perth, there was a lot of understanding, but now she was alone by herself and had to deal with four boys <laughs> who were, uh, yes, cantankerous to say that. I, I think I was, you know, a good arguer, and she thought I was cantankerous, so, you know. <laughs> tomato, tomato. And my mum grieved because of my father. But she never stopped, as she said, praying for him. Everyone else was angry about him. But she said, I still love him. If I never see him again, I hope that he puts things right before God for what he's done. And I hope he puts things right with you for what he's done. And this goes on for years and years and years. Eventually, I relate to my dad again, and he's he feels guilty. He feels like a broken man. I'm the only one of the family he gets to see again for years. And my mum keeps praying for him, keeps talking to other people as if she still forgives him and loves him. And I still remember the day that not long after he left, that he'd come back while we were at church, because he knew we'd be at church, let himself in and taken the record collection. And it was just mum sitting on the floor crying, because it was just the last kind of little stiletto between the ribcage, leaving her with very little. This is a lady who left school at 14, who has never worked since the age of 19 with nothing. And I know I don't maybe don't want to say it in this room, but thank goodness for Bob Hall putting up the, <laughs> putting up the, uh, the family assistance because it was, it was hard for years especially with my two younger brothers, for my mum to survive. She retrained and she became involved in aged care work where she was the administrator of an aged care facility. But still she prayed for my dad and I just said, oh, that doesn't work. And still she forgave him, even though our friends said, look, he's, he's this, he's that, he's the other. It was interesting that one day, not about, oh, maybe 12 to 13 years ago, it was mum's birthday. And she came to the door because we had everyone around at our house. My wife and I had everyone from the family and my in-laws around to our house. And mum was in tears. What was wrong with mum? And she said, I got a phone call today. I said, yeah. I was waiting for some bad news. It was your father. By this stage, he had left his second wife and a couple of kids and done the same thing. He got in the car and driven away. Unable to cope, I think, with his own self. It was your father. And that just struck me that I didn't quite know how to deal with that. Asking me for forgiveness. And she had built up a life of forgiving in her heart and her head about her husband. So it was second nature in her to say, of course I forgive you. Of course I forgive you. And dad came back into our lives like the dog that's peed on the carpet, you know, tail between legs. So he never could feel the weight of forgiveness in his own life. And he repaired his relationship with my mum, with me as best as he could, but never my twin brother. We never saw him again. And he came back into our lives and he said, I know I'm forgiven, but I just can't forgive myself. He was his own mini cancel culture within. He looked at his life and he went, there's no way that 
God could forgive me for this, but I, I technically know because I'm a Northern Irish Protestant who ticks all the boxes <laughs> that I can do that, but I don't feel that. I don't feel that. And my mom saw that in my dad and still she helped him and still she looked after him when he needed something. She would go around to his place and make him a meal. <coughs> About six years ago, seven years ago, my dad started to get shaking like that. He's a very nervous type at the best of times, but he was soon forgetting everything. And then what's the scratch on the side of your car, dad? And why are you driving a car while you live near a primary school? Because I don't think that's a good idea. You're gonna, oh. So he gave up his license and eventually he was diagnosed with early onset Louis body dementia in his terrible disease in his mid to late sixties. And he went downhill rapidly. And I remember him getting into an aged care facility because uh, we had to find him somewhere to go and it was very hard to find places. And I know aged care at the moment is not got the best wraps, but we looked at places that looked like crazy places, like from one flew over the cuckoo's nest, to be honest. And then all the way through to palaces, then they said, well, if you've got $450,000 bond, I said, my dad who worked in a factory all his life and doesn't own a house and train wrecked our family and we had to sell the family house, no, there's not, unless he's got 450, unless he's got a side hustle that I haven't known about, there's not $450,000. So you're going to have to go in wherever we can find you, a place. And the transition place that the government provides, he went in there, he was terrified of being by, of not being by himself. He'd grown up so much in the last 10 years by himself, he was scared of sharing a room or a bathroom with anyone. And we go into this big room and I thought, this is great, there's no one here, Dad. This is the transition place, we're looking for a place for you. He sits down and you hear this voice, I'm Barry, get away. Oh, oh, crumbs and behind his curtain, there's Barry. And he looked a bit like one flew over the cookies nest. And um, he says, you've got to put your name on everything you've got. I thought, I bet you do. And there was a state, set of steak knives with Barry was here written on the side of them. And uh, dad was terrified. And I said, we'll find you somewhere. And we eventually, with the help of my mum, found him a place because where there's death, there's hope, right? So those, they churn people out of aged care facilities. As I learned later, by the time you die, you've got a day to get everyone and everything out. So we got this place in a beautiful setting that had to give 30% of its rooms to people with no bond. And my mum would come every week, get on the bus, she's never had a license, two buses and a train to go to Mount Lawley in Perth to visit my dad and bring him food and read to him and then get on the bus and the train and go back. And I used to go in like you do when you're going to see an aged person a person who's got dementia, I'll be in every week. Much to my shame, that doesn't happen. Your friendships flow away, the few that he had left. Your life flows away. Everything gets confined and confined and confined to a smaller space. And even the books that you bring in for him, by the time he's got Louis body dementia, he can't read, he can't speak. He's went from walking stick to frame to wheelchair to sitting down to bed chair in a year. And about a year before he died, unable to speak by this stage, I thought I better go and see dad. And I walked in to the place and you know, you don't sit in the chairs in those places. I've, that's what they've told me. So <laughs> you don't sit in the chairs because the, uh, the residents sit in the chairs and uh, <laughs> they're always cleaning always cleaning and even the smell. I mean, COVID has done my head in because all I can smell is aged care facility on my hands. <laughs> Every time you use the, uh, your, your sort of uh, alcohol rubs. And I walk in and I go to walk into my dad's room and the smell is overpowering. Oh no, and dad had soiled himself. And I look and mum was there. I said, mum, she said, hi. I, I said, it's a mess all over the floor. I said, I'm going to go and get someone. She said, I've got this. I've got this. Don't worry about it, dear. I've got this. She's down on her hands and knees, cleaning the crap off the floor. For all the crap that my dad had given my mum, she was there to take a little bit more. I had to walk out. <laughs> I was in tears. Not that it will smell. But my mum did that all the way deep forgiveness for my dad when she could have done exactly the opposite and walked away from him. 
part of the reason, in fact, not even part of the reason, integral reason that she understood the nature of forgiveness for herself. She understood that Jesus did clean up our crap. <laughs> so God's looking at this world of unforgiveness and gracelessness. What am I going to do? And Jesus goes, I've got this. I've got this. And he comes and cleans up ours. And if there were a little bit more of that in the culture, if people understood what it meant to be deeply forgiven for something, deep forgiveness could ensue. And I look at my mum and the way she behaved over those, the long haul of forgiveness to that point that she said, I've got this, I've got this. That's where forgiveness has to be in the culture that's coming. If there's no place where we look at the mess that's been made by someone else and say, let me help you with that. What chance when we've made our own mess of anyone doing that for us? I think it's going to become a much more brutal, unforgiving world. I think Douglas Murray is right. It's a highly hostile cancel culture, fiery renunciation and you will fall through the gaps. Those students growing up are going to struggle in a world like that because there's no forgiveness. But Jesus who says, I've got this, I've got this, that's transformative. That's transformative. And perhaps you're here today and you feel like I've made a mess on the carpet. <laughs> Is there anyone who can pick me up and clean me up? At that point, Jesus says, I've got this. I've got this. Thanks for listening, gents. Steve, thanks for sharing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing. Um, ordinarily, if an article is written by a clergyman, I turn to the next page. <laughs> but I, I make an exception for you. And uh, one of the reasons is when you wrote that story up, uh, I was going getting divorced myself, mm. and, and uh, it spoke to me very powerfully that uh, that 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 particular story. Um, that's not what I ask. Where do we get into this mess where we're all cancelling each other? Mm. Like the, the doc, Dr. Zeus is now off the shelf, and, and so is Mr. Potato Head, amongst yeah. other uh, crazy stuff and that's just this year where did it all start that's an interesting question one of uh thought and written about in the last few years that there's a uh, I'll, I'll mention the, that other great city melbourne uh, mark sayers in melbourne is a great writer uh, and a pastor in which melbourne is a very progressive secular city even more so than sydney i think uh, and it's certainly got less of a framework i think of a christian framework in the same way that sydney has got that seems embedded here compared to perth for example but he talks about the fact that many of the things that the gospel gave us, that Christianity gave us in the West, the frameworks of thinking about how you do forgiveness, how you do, uh, you know, love your neighbour, etc., have been co-opted without Jesus being taken with them. So what you get, he says, is a very zealous culture for what's right. They want the kingdom without the king. So the king, King Jesus, in that setting, gives us this world of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The story of looking out for the neglected and the poor and the needy. But under the framework of it all is that we are all made in the image of God the same way and we're all before God um, equal and Jesus himself is the one who offers us forgiveness. But if you take the Jesus bit out, what you find is this very zealous culture that's looking for sin in, sin in every corner but no way to offer you forgiveness for it. It's looking for, we want this to be right and we're going to make it right our way. But there's no a tempering nature of someone like Jesus in the setting. It's the kingdom, all those things that you've got without the king. So what you end up getting is this, it ramps up the level of self-righteousness. And it also ramps up the level of uh, uh, self-evident self-righteousness. You don't have to just be right. You have to be seen to be right, which is a very pharisaical attitude 
The Pharisees in the Bible were not the Shylocks, evil and mean and grasping. They were the heroes of the culture in the Jewish faith of the first century, but they were evidently self-righteous. They promoted it. And our culture is about promoting how righteous I am, because no one is going to be able to say to righteous us. The point of the Bible with Jesus is that he makes us right with God. Take him out of the picture. That's a self-help effort right there. And I think that's part of the process, that we want the kingdom without the king. And I think that sours what we're looking for. That's where I think, and it's just, it's coming to a head of steam, I think. Hopefully it's coming to a head of steam, because I can't imagine how it works. Thank you for that. Just an extension of that. If, sorry, if you have the kingdom without the king, how, what does that say about suffering and victimhood? In the Christian context, suffering is seen as being a necessary part of life. But if, for example, you're Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, then clearly you've been prejudiced against, you've suffered tremendously. It's a kind of secular version of the same thing? Uh, that's a very interesting observation. I, I uh, obse You have kudos if you are a sufferer in the current cultural context. And so it's a bit like a game of cards. You can play the suffer card or the victim card, and that gives you a, sta a status level, ironically. Suffering is sort of seen as, a, as an achievement, a certain kind of suffering, I think. Um, not silent suffering and not suffering for doing good necessarily, but suffering and victimhood are now seen as positives in a culture in which we, it's the age of exposure, isn't it? It's like everyone's been exposed for something. And to be able to pronounce that I'm a victim actually moves you up the order. Whereas a victim in the past was way down the pecking order, but everyone has to find a way to be a victim. Now, I don't think as Christians, we should play that game because I think Christian suffering is a little different. Think about the Bible, it says, after you've suffered a little while, yeah, how, how, little, how, how long is a little while? Uh, until Jesus comes back. Oh, who? what? <laughs> the idea of suffering in the Bible is if you suffer for doing good, you know, that's a good thing, but you don't have to promote it. So we have this culture which says uh, it's kind of the power structures. We're going to flip those around and say the power structure in our society, it is about power. If I can show the most victimhood, I've actually got a powerful position in the culture at the moment. The intersectionality issue is big on that. How many playing cards can you show suffering? Now, that's not to diminish suffering when people have suffered and the church has to address some of these own issues, as we know. But the whole cultural framework has shifted in its understanding of what victimhood and suffering means. And if you get someone who's one of the wealthiest people on the planet, the three tropes, I think, are especially around race and uh, mental health and gender, those are the, the cards that, I'm careful saying cards, those are the issues that you have to be very careful as you walk around. What do people mean by victimhood there? What do they mean by suffering there? So it's, the language is, is the state the same, but how you engage with that has changed, I think. That's the long answer. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Um, you spoke about uh, society needs uh, forgiveness. So how do, um, how do we get people to a state where they actually recognize that they need forgiveness? Because I think you, sp you speak about the concept of third culture, like do, these, do people in this culture think that they need forgiveness from something because a lot of what I see, you know, particularly with younger people um, and you saw the March um, earlier this week, um, they think that they need justice, that they want justice. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you could explore that. Yeah. Well, well, a justice culture without a forgiveness culture is a very dangerous thing. I'm not saying that everyone needs to be forgiven for everything they do in the sense of there needs to be justice, but there ha justice and grace are two planets that hold each other in their orbit. And if you cut one off and it spins off, it's gonna go in any direction it wants. I think that's critical. That justice in the Bible is a different thing to what I think we're seeing now. The problem with it at the moment is, what's the end point of that? Is there a telos or a goal of justice? What does it look like when justice is achieved? I think that's a very gray area in our culture at the moment. It justice is achieved in my mind when I feel satisfied that justice is done. Well, that's a bit arbitrary. There's, and you're seeing that in the whole thing around uh, with Christian Porter. How does the law feel with that? How, to, how, how do you have an independent inquiry about something that 
you have no way of recourse of knowing what happened. Those things are part of the issue. So justice is now seen, this is the key, that people say, we don't want a vengeful God. And you go, I don't know, I kind of do, because we outsource vengeance somewhere. And now it's, you know, it's here. <laughs> uh, if there is no God who says, do not repay evil for evil, I am a God of vengeance, that's a safety valve on vengeance. Otherwise, the only vengeance you have is the tribalism of a thousand years ago you know, in the Scandinavian countries. Hey, here we are. It's the same kind of tribalism and vengeance process, just a little bit more sophisticated for the 21st century. So I think it's, it's a dangerous place to go because where is, where is full justice? Just a little bit more, just a little bit more. We, we're, we're always changing the line and redefining it. And I think it will bring mob rule at one level into something, unless our institutions are strong enough to be able to hold that back. I'll let you decide whether they are. <laughs> uh, thanks. thanks for your talk this morning. Um, I just wanted to ask about your brother, who's the atheist. Yes. How, how's that divergence? Like, same family, same upbringing, mm -hmm. you've gone one way, he's gone the other. And then secondly, when he thinks, I don't know if you had the conversation, but yeah, does he feel remorse about not seeing your father again? Very interesting. I'll answer the first bit first. Not really. My, my twin brother is the professor of brain science at Macquarie and the head of the Hearing Hub of Australia. He used to be the head of the UK Ear Institute and uh, professor of brain science at University College London. Dad, factory worker. So the gap is massive. My brother feels he is a self-made man. You know, don't you think the 10 pound pom thing, getting on a plane to come to Perth from Belfast in 1973 might've had something to do with that? And dad date made that decision. So he doesn't see the train of, okay, dad wasn't there for us and he left before we started university, but he provided and he, up till that age and we're here in Australia because of him. He doesn't see that. So I think he lacks grace at that level. So he's very self-righteous on that level. Um, Growing up, we all believed the same thing sort of thing, but his reflection of it is very, it was a terrible upbringing, it was very harsh. Shows something about memory, doesn't it? That we don't remember events, we remember memories of events and, you know, memories of memories of memories of events. And my upbringing, I think, wasn't too bad. He, he's been married three times. He's got a two-year-old, a six-year-old, a 31-year-old and a 27-year-old. So life's gone in a divergent direction for my twin brother. The Center for Public Christianity interviewed us about a year and a half ago for a podcast, an atheist. We're identical. We even dress as elegantly as I am here today. <laughs> the same. <laughs> and it was an interesting conversation because he's, he's, he's into scientism as much as he's into science. I cannot see it. I cannot observe it. It's, you know, special privilege to say that there is a God, you know, that's, there's no God. And yet, there's chinks in his armour. In that conversation, we go back to his house, he lives in the, in uh, just near Kirribilli, and we're on the ferry eating an ice cream. I said, I never knew that you thought that about your upbringing or spiritual aspect. I never knew that story, and I've known you all my life, you know, since before we were born, we were in the womb together. So there's a few chinks in his armor about mystery and where things might be going. And as we get older, because ironically, coincidentally, we'll be 54 on the same day today, this year. Um, I wonder what the next 20 years looks like. I always think that in myself, that life feels like, yes, achieve, achieve, achieve. And then it just, you know, I'm a runner. I, and you know a runner because they tell you about it. And a vegan runner is insufferable, I tell you. <laughs> And I'm going, I'm still PBing because I'm doing a lot of weights at the moment and I started running late-ish. But it's going to do that. And that's what our lives do. And they end up maybe like my father because Lee body dementia is hereditary and I'm 15 years off from the age he was when he got put in an aged care facility. And I wonder what the end of life or the last third of life does for us as we think about that. Is it just about legacy or is it saying, is there something beyond? My mum waited how many years for my dad to turn around? And she says the same thing about my brother. 
I'm praying for him that he comes back to understanding. I go, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, she got that right with Dad. I better be careful. Because <laughs> I am like a little bit, oh, yeah, that's going to happen. I had dinner with him the other night, you know. And apparently in schools here, they have a thing called SRE. Yeah? Not in, not in secular Perth, you know, good old kingdom without the king Perth. And he said his six-year-old's coming home from school. Going, He's singing, the best book to read is the Bible. I said, didn't we sing that back in Northern Ireland? And, and he said, well, and I thought, well, there you go. Maybe your son will be the person who shares the news of Jesus with you again in a way that I can't with all my intellect, because my brother and I are intellectually sparring all the time. On these things. There's a chink in his armour, though, I reckon. Just following on from that, was uh, what was your brother's reaction to hearing you relate the story of your mother cleaning up your father's yeah. mess? He was a bit shocked by it, I think. That I, I think he probably thinks I reveal too much stuff from who we are as a family. Um, his wife probably is a little bit more touched by it than she's got a, a, an interesting spiritual framework, I think, and. Uh, he didn't say much because if he goes there, it's he's going into uncharted waters, I think, again. Because the irony, I think, and this is just about my twin brother, I love him very much, is that for all his success, I still see him striving for approval from someone. And we think that's our father. And the safety net to that is our heavenly father who approves of us already. When you've got approval like that that you don't have to try and earn, it liberates you to, it gives you a wide ba boundaries to run to. And I still see that little thing in him always achieving and always, you know, I probably lack ambition in his eyes. And uh, I said, well, maybe we're just aiming for different things. I don't know. But um, it's a good question and it's a good, it's one I'm going <laughs> to ponder more as I think of. Thanks for uh, sharing. Um, I just uh, want to ask, how did you see your mum grow in... The story about your mum's amazing, I think. Um, and just her ability to forgive and to be so humble in that, I find incredible. Did you, how did you see that grow or did you talk to her much about that experience? Um, I'd love to just hear a bit more about what she thought. Yeah, well, we talk a lot. Uh, we're Northern Irish, we're either fighting or talking. And, uh, but Northern Irish families like ours tend to grapple with it, this stuff I've found. What I think I noticed with my mum is that, as you can imagine from the first part of the story, she's always looking for a home. She's always looking for a safe place to be. And she felt she was ripped away from that at the age of eight and never saw her foster mother again. So. When she married and she came to Perth, she always felt homeless because home was Northern Ireland. And she has no father to begin with, a distant grandfather to live in the house with when she went back to Belfast. Her own husband abandons her and she's on the floor with those records gone. And that, that was the low point for my mum. And I think what happened was that she said, God is going to have to be my father in this position. If Jesus says, you're heavenly father, then I'm just going to have to believe that. And I can, I can pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father out in heaven, many different ways. But if I feel like I've been abandoned by someone and I have no one left, you pray our Father in a very different way. And interestingly, watching my mum's life and listening to her conversation, her more mature together friends were much more hostile towards my dad than my mum ever was. But they've come back to her and gone, you proved us right. And my mum then worked in aged care. And what she did, she thought, I'm going to serve other people and help them because they look lonely, they look broken. So she, she's now living in an aged care facility herself. And she's the go-to person, helping people with the meds, helping people get shopping, things like that. I think what she said was, I can, go, I can become bitter. I can look for short-term fixes to this 
but I'm going to trust God. And it, I, my parents split up when my mum was 40, and I went, well, she's nearly dead anyway. So I wasn't married, she's was 40. And then so oh, 40, that's so young. And she has been, she's endured for 36 years since then. And as she nears the finishing post, she said, it was the little decision she made along the way. I will forgive, I will serve, I will not get bitter. Those micro decisions, because I think we all think like the movies that, you know, there's some jerk in a movie and then the world's invaded by aliens and he becomes the hero. It doesn't happen that way. It, the pressure shows who you are. And my mum, when the pressure has been faced, has every turn just gone, I'm going to trust God in this. I'm going to trust God on this. and I'm not going to go down the bitter line or the angry line. So I couldn't see one momental, momental decision. It was Six Sigma. <laughs> she just, everything just changed a little bit. And she kept on a long, straight path forward. Not easy. Always, you know, never easy for mum. But I think that got her to 76, not bitter. There's nothing worse than aged care facilities full of bitter, angry, grumpy people. Why are they so good? Why are they so bitter, angry, and grumpy? Because they've had years of practice. <laughs> they're experts. They haven't PB'd yet until they're really bitter, angry, and grumpy. Not mum. And she's got her flaws. Man, she tells you, she's Northern Irish. She likes to tell you what you, oh, you put on a bit of weight. That's my wife, my mum. Do you not say that about my, my wife? And, oh, you look a bit thin, she says to me. And I have a twin brother, I've got another brother who's fairly large. You're going to die of a heart attack, you're too fat. Then she looks at me and said, you're going to die of a heart attack running. I said, you know, it would be really funny if you died of a heart attack, bro. But, yeah, I can't say. <laughs> so, flawed. But faith. That's it. I, she's not Teflon. But it showcases how good God is in her life, not how good mum is, I think. That's what the Lord say. Uh, I'd just be interested in, in such an aggressively secular culture, how do we go about putting the king back in the kingdom? Yeah. It's a great question. It is a secular culture. Uh, I'm writing a uh, something for uh, City Bible Forum at the moment called Never More Hostile, Never More Open. And it feels hostile towards some of the Christian frameworks that Christians are no longer seen as the solution to the problem of the culture, but part of the problem. So the huge barrier at that level. But Tim Keller said it recently that if he were to speak to people again about sharing the gospel message of Jesus in our cultural context, he would not say to people, learn the six rules of the gospel. He would say, learn to listen to the questions being asked at the school gate. I think there's a chink in people's armour. The Bob Dylan song, Most of the Time, has Bob Dylan singing about, he's over that girl, and he gets on with life, and things are good. Pause. Most of the time. Most of the time. I think we live in a most of the time context. We live in a great place. We've avoided most of the COVID stuff. And life is great for most people, most of the time. But something happens. Something you. And I don't think people love to ask questions. I think if, uh, the Christian church could do well by saying, let's not man the barricades, let's create good communities that people who are broken by this cancel culture or unforgiveness or the sexual revolution of where you have to have a consent app, <laughs> for goodness sake, how far have we gone? Could come to our doors in churches and Christian communities and say, how do you do forgiveness? How do you do loving people that are not like you? How do you do serving other people? How do you do sex? And if all the church can say is, oh, just like everyone else, they'll trudge away like this. <laughs> I think the Christian community is an opportunity to shine brightly and show what true forgiveness looks like with the king in the kingdom. It's a long-term venture, I think. Let's, um, let's thank Steve again. Thanks, guys.